My name is Jablan Etliwayo, Technical Director at FiberGuide. In this video, I'm extending your understanding of light emitting diodes from the previous tutorial to laser diodes. Now, if I started by asking viewers what did they think about lasers, I might get a myriad of answers depending on people's backgrounds and interests. Some will think of laser printers, some will think of laser surgery. Those in the mining industry might think of laser diamond cutting machines. Those in the semiconductor industry may think of photolithography or the use of lasers to print circuits on chips. Even more fascinating, those who are futuristic may think of Star Wars. The list goes on and on. There are so many different types of lasers based on their applications or how they operate. While our focus is on semiconductor laser diodes used in optical communications, what is common about lasers is in their name. The acronym LASER stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. At the end of this tutorial, you should be able to understand how stimulated emission is achieved in laser diodes. You should also be able to describe the amplification process, absorption, and the operation of the Fabry Perot laser diode. In addition, you should become familiar with common types of semiconductor lasers used in optical communication systems. Now, recall the recombination of electrons and holes to give light in the previous video. The process, as we discussed, is best described by an energy diagram. When an electron in the conduction band falls to the ground state, it emits a photon. Remember that the source of energy that excites electrons from the valence band to the conduction band is an electric voltage. Another source of energy that can excite an electron is a photon of light. If a photon happens to pass through the material, it can excite an electron by transferring all of its energy to the electron. In this case, the photon energy is absorbed by the electron, resulting in the annihilation of the photon. Now, if the electron falls back to the valence band, it will emit a photon as before. This is still spontaneous emission. If an electron is already in the excited state, and a photon passes by, the photon could cause the electron to fall to the lower energy state. Now, because the electron is already at a higher energy level, it only takes the photon an infinitesimal amount of energy to get the electron down to a lower energy level. In this case, photon retains the, its energy, a process sometimes known as quantum perturbation. In this process, we end up with two photons, the incident photon and a new replica of itself. The process is called stimulated emission. If there's a large number of excited electrons, a single photon can trigger a domino effect of stimulated photon emission as follows. The first photon causes an electron to fall to the valence band, generating another photon in the process so that we end up with two photons. The two photons cause two electrons to drop to the valence band, generating additional two photons, resulting in a total of four. The four photons in turn give rise to eight photons, and so on. This represents the amplification process. Because of the endless supply of pump energy in the form of bias voltage, electron excitation and stimulation processes continue unabated. Now, here is the structure of a laser diode. In addition to the n-type and p-type regions we discussed in the previous video, there is an intrinsic region of undobbed semiconductor material, also known as the active region. Electrons and holes are pumped into this region to recombine and emit light. Because of its refractive index difference with the n-type and p-type materials, 
the intrinsic region acts as a wave guide that will guide light along the region perpendicular to the direction of the current. One end of the active region is coated with a reflective material that will reflect light into the active region. The other surface is coated with a partially reflecting material so that a percentage of light is reflected in the active region while another percentage of light is transmitted. This arrangement forms a fabri resonator that can form standing waves of light, a condition for lasting. For a standing wave to occur, the separation between the surfaces must be an integral multiple of half the wavelength. In other words, L equals Q lambda over 2, where L is the surface separation, Q is an integer, and lambda is the wavelength. When the separation equals half a wavelength of light, you have the first mod number, or Q equals 1. When the separation equals the wavelength of light, you have the second mode number, or Q equals 2. When the reflective surface separation equals 5 times the wavelength, then you have the tenth mode number, or Q equals 10, and so on and so on. The modes of a fabri perot resonator are best represented by the spectrum, a plot of intensity versus wavelength. Here is a spectrum of a fabri perot resonator with a large number of resonant peaks. Billions of such peaks are possible in an ideal fabri perot resonator. However, in a fabri perot laser, the spectrum is a superposition of the spectrum of the resonator and the compound semiconductor material gain spectrum. The gain spectrum depends on the semiconductor material and may resemble the corresponding LED spectrum discussed in the previous video. The result is a spectrum with a limited number of peaks and a much narrower line width than the LED. This is because the effective gain is affected by losses due to absorption, scattering, and reflection at the interface. Now let's look at the properties of a fabri perot laser light. Like all other lasers, fabri perot laser light is nearly monochromatic. Light waves have almost the same wavelength. Laser light is coherent. In other words, waves are in phase, or if they're out of phase, the phase difference between them is constant over a certain defined time. Now laser light is collimated, that is to say light waves travel almost in the same direction, making their beam divergence significantly better than that of LEDs. Laser light has high brightness. In other words, the power of the laser light is concentrated in a small surface area. Fabri perot lasers are simple and inexpensive to produce. For long distance networks, including long haul terrestrial networks and submarine networks, single mode and narrow line with lasers such as distributed feedback lasers or DFB and external cavity lasers are used. For a more detailed treatment of laser diodes, please read the Fiber Guide blog article on laser diodes. To learn more about uh, optical networking, consider taking the OTT's optical networking training courses, details of which can be found on fiberguide.net. This concludes the video on laser diodes. Here are the next steps. In the next video, we look at how properties of light sources are simulated using optic system. In the video that follows, we will look at photodetectors. Finally, as always, if you would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe. Thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.